Hello, everyone. Um, uh, to this first session of today's Research in UK Local History event. Um, over the next hour, four speakers, including Dr. Michelle Johansson from the Bishopsgate Institute in London, Argula Rublak from Senate House Library, as well as myself, Michael Townsend from the Institute of Historical Research, will give a number of brief presentations about various features of our um, respective library collections in line with today's general theme of towns and cities before finishing up with a Q&A session at the end. Uh, however, without any further delay, uh, let's move on to our first speaker uh, this morning, which is uh, Monica Cash, Deputy Librarian at the Linen Hall Library in Belfast. So over to you, Monica. Good morning, everybody. It is a pleasure to speak to you this morning. Um, I just need to share my screen, which worked earlier, but... What that's happened. I'm very conscious of time, so I don't want to delay anybody. Um, apologies. Why does this? Um, let me see. Is that, Michelle, maybe somebody else wants to go first. I seem to be having a few technical difficulties here. Apologies about that. Um, Shall we move on to Michelle? Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. Hello, good morning, everybody. Hello, no problem, Monica. You can just uh, jump in after me, I would think. Um, Oh, thank, uh, Mike, you. thank you very much for introducing us and good morning and welcome everybody to um, today's session. I'm going to share my screen now and uh, then we will start the first presentation. So here we go. Researching London's East End at Bishopsgate Institute. Um, so this is the subject matter for my talk this morning. I'm Michelle Johansson. I'm Interpretation Manager at Bishopsgate Institute. And uh, on the right there, you can see a photograph of Bishopsgate Institute, which is located on the borders of the city of London and the East End, so right in the heart of London. And as you can see from that photograph, the image was taken um, some time ago. The building has been open to the public for 125 years now, offering a library, a great hall where we hold concerts, talks, lectures and so on. But the library is the key part of the Institute's work, and that's what I'm going to be talking about this morning, of course. And I'm going to focus quite closely, as I say, on London's East End, just to narrow things down, because we haven't got a lot of time to speak, but we do have many collections relating to wider histories than that. And if anyone does want to um, follow us on Twitter, we're at Bishop's Science, and I am at Historitage on Twitter, sharing plenty of things from our collections and about the work that we do. Some of you may be wondering about my job title, Interpretation Manager is a slightly weird title within the sector, it doesn't make that much sense, but the way that I make it makes sense is I talk about interpreting our special collections and library collections for different audiences, and the main way that I do that is through courses and workshops. So you can see here some photographs I've taken of people undertaking the courses that I offer, and also on this screen I've put up a few of the courses that are upcoming as part of our Adult Learners Programme. I've also done courses and sessions for um, projects for school groups for community groups and so on but why I like these photographs is that they immediately introduce you to some of the items that we have in our London collections you can see at a glance what we've got there we've got pamphlets we've got books we've got maps and also if you look very closely you can see some of the items that we have and what they relate to so you can see someone's leafing through a tourist guidebook there a very glossy gorgeous item from the 1890s and then somebody is just about to look at a pamphlet there about the Thames we've got so many items on the Thames it's untrue so if you're interested in the history of the river definitely pop into Bishopsgate Institute to have a look at those so that's the work that I do at Bishopsgate Institute as interpretation manager exploring the collections and I'm going to talk to you about some of the materials that we've got. 
We've got absolutely thousands and thousands of really gorgeous pamphlets that cover London's history since about the early 1800s. I mean, I've got some examples from the 20th century here. We have got lots of Victorian items as well. We don't tend to go further back, but we do come further forward. So our collections, very dynamic, come right up to the present day. And some examples that I've got here really give you a sense of the breadth of what we cover. So you can see there the International Fire Exhibition, Earl's Court, 1903. We've got so much exhibition stuff. So if you're interested in the growth of London suburbs in the late 19th, early 20th century, those exhibition materials are going to be really useful to you. Particularly, for example, we've got a lot on the Crystal Palace. So we've got the Crystal Palace when it was in Hyde Park for the Great Exhibition, but also when it moved to South East London. So that expansion of the suburbs is represented in our collections. We've got a pamphlet on shopping there. London for the Curious is a guidebook to London from the 1930s. We've got loads and loads of guidebooks going right back to the early 19th century, and they are brilliant for giving you insight into local history. Swinging London there, a guide to where the action is, lists all of the cool boutiques. Obviously, you can see at a glance that's from the 1960s. So if you're interested in Swinging London, that item there will really give you the kind of detail about where the best boutiques were located. Lions Corner Houses there, we've got lots of stuff on restaurants. Regent Palace Hotel, lots of hotel guides. We've got nightclubs, nightclub guides as well. If you want to know where to go dancing in London in the 1980s, we've got a disco guide as well, which is just brilliant. Then you can see Dolphin Square. That's a, a reminder that we've got lots of stuff on the history of housing as well. Dolphin Square was a luxury development uh, in the 1930s, which uh, opened in Westminster. But we've also got lots of stuff on municipal housing as well, on working class housing. And then you can see Egon Rone's coffee guide. So that gives you an insight into cafes and the sort of low middle class, working class kind of places, as well as the more upper class stories are represented in our collection for the most part. And then you can see the Fidelity Junior Guide to Cockney London, which takes us into our East End subject matter today. So that is, uh, you can see on the front cover there, including lots of full colour stamps. And what's brilliant is that the stamps are still there in the item today to look at. So some really lurid, colourful examples of the pamphlets in our London collection that can help you discover the East End and London more widely. But moving into the East End, we've got at least a million photographs in our collections covering all different subject areas. And I've just selected a few examples here for you today that show different things taking place in the East End of London. And what they tell us here at the top left, we've got the Brookfield Manor Girls Club based in Hackney Wick in London and the sister club of the Eton Manor Boys Club, which we also have their collection as well. And at the bottom on the right, you can see the River Christian Centre, which was a youth club, a family club based in um, the uh, Canning Town area of East London. And they were also known as the Mayflower Club in the, in the uh, earlier part of the 20th century. So those items there tell us about leisure in London. We've got some street photographs too. You can see bottom left, that's Derrick Brook. Photograph taken around 1960. Anyone familiar with the Whitechapel area of London will know that is taken just across the road from the London Hospital, just outside uh, Whitechapel Tube. And it sort of gives the light of that swinging London uh, book before, doesn't it? I mean, that's hardly swinging London. That's taken in the early 1960s. Very drab, very bleak looking. And then at the top on the right there, we've got the associations of the East End with the rag trade. And that's a group of women who are working small scale clothing production in the East End of London in the post-war period. So plenty to explore in our photograph collections as well as the pamphlets. We've also got collections that are covering individual lives and experiences. So we have the archive of Frederick Porter Wensley there on the left, who was a beat copper in the East End of London in the late 19th century, went on to become a celebrity detective in the interwar period. And his collection consists of scrapbooks, mug shots, and these gorgeous apprehension notebooks here that you can see um, on the screen, you've got the notebook cover and then one page open. And this is where Wensley listed all of his arrests and then what happened afterwards. So if you're interested in the history of crime, the Wensley collection is your go-to collection. Then on the right, we've got Muriel Lester, who was a philanthropist and pacifist and community activist. And she set up with her sister Kingsley Hall in Bow in East London, and then the outpost at Dagenham as well. They had a second Kingsley Hall in Dagenham. Muriel Lester was a friend of Gandhi, an incredibly important woman, campaigned across the world for on behalf of pacifism. And her collection, boxes and boxes of letters, press cuttings and more, is also in our archive. And so that can be explored as well. But I'm going to take you on a very quick case study, which is a thrill not to be missed. We're going immediately now to Petticoat Lane Market. You can see a postcard on the left, and that gives you 
insight into why this was a thrill not to be missed. This is Petticoat Lane around the early 1900s, and you can see the crowds of people packed into the street there looking at the stalls. And then a photograph on the right from the Dennis Anthony, clutch of photographs that we have in the collections that captured the markets um, that were taking place in the East End of London in the early 1960s. So we've got lots of postcards, lots of photographs that do deal with uh, market culture, shopping culture more widely, but specifically, Petticoat Lane. And this is one of my favourite items from our um, special collections at Bishopsgate Institute. This is a pamphlet guide and souvenir programme to Petticoat Lane, a wonderful market in Stepney, London, and known the world over. So this huge post about how this market was known the world over, but that makes a really important link between the East End of London and the wider world, which are links that are played out across our collections. And if you look closely, that looks a slightly blurry image on the front cover there, but you can see the crowds of people. Again, this is a, an item from the 1940s you can see all of the people packed in there looking at the market stalls and it actually says on the cover 100,000 people every Sunday. This pamphlet was very proud of the amount of people that came to the East End of London simply to go to Petticoat Lane Market at this time. The back cover, this is where we get the quotation, busy Petticoat Lane, a thrill not to be missed. And then you get a bit of detail here, local detail, you get the map, you get Barnet sandwiches are mapped out there and those numbers there are codes which are then listed inside the pamphlet itself. So this is a real snapshot of one moment in time at Petticoat Lane Market. You open it up, this is what you see inside, lots of information here. Again, we see the rag trade here, writ large across these materials, but also insight into where visitors to the market might go to get a cup of coffee. For me, certainly I want to go to the Middlesex Cafe or Ziggy's on Cobb Street, that's absolutely where I want to be. But I also absolutely love this as well, carts, dresses, coats, costumes, from junior miss to 60 hips. So we start to see the kind of people that are being catered for in the local rag trade there. And then as well, if people are interested in data, they list how many stalls there are. Middlesex Street, about 400 stalls. Goldstone Street, 150 stalls. Wentworth Street, 200 stalls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a really brilliant item that is rich in information and data for anyone interested in local histories. And before I end, I wanted to take a quick comfort break and take you along to East End Loos. We've got Jonathan Rao's excellent Good Loo guide here. And I focused, of course, on the East End Loos because I love this petticoat lane here. It practically helps you to feel that you're there at the time. Ladies, cowboy type swing doors, push them open, 1968 cubicle that has a very pretty bold patterned in Dresden blue. So this level of local detail is really um, uh, there to be unlocked in the Institute's collections. Finally then, a little bit of the overall arching information that you might want. Our special collections include photographs, the Lama slides I haven't mentioned. These are thousands and thousands of black and white slides of London taken in the early part of the 20th century for the most part beautiful items that you can see on our website covering all kinds of London exteriors, plenty of church interiors as well. We've got press cuttings, badges, diaries, manuscripts. We've also got these individual archives that I mentioned, whether of institutions or personal collections. Our library comprises around 150,000 printed items. We've got books, guidebooks, pamphlets, journals, zines and periodicals, maps and street directories, which are wonderful for mapping the local area. And this is, of course, not just East End of London, this is London more widely. And then the themes covered include poverty, crime, community and philanthropy. We've got a huge and growing LGBTQ plus collection, particularly looking at the period from the 1960s onwards. Leisure, shopping, protest and radicalism are represented. Uh, Docks and the River, as I've said, women's history, of course, work and labour, and by labour I mean trade union movement. We've got so much stuff from the 19th century about the growth of the trade unions and the rise of the Labour Party more generally, and the history of housing is represented. And then to end, the key questions you will want to know. The way to access these materials, our catalogue is online, so you can do a keyword search on that. And also most of our collections are listed online as well. So go to our website, bishopsgate.org.uk explore for yourself then come to visit everybody is welcome you don't need to be a member you don't need to pre-book just turn up and you'll be welcome and because most of our materials are stored on site by most I mean 99% of our materials it means that my colleagues can fetch stuff up for you really really quickly so what that means is that you can just come in order the stuff and it will be brought to you within I'd say 20 minutes on a bad day Quite often it'll be five, 10 minutes and you'll have the stuff straight away. So you don't need to be the kind of person that has to pre-plan everything. You can just turn up and enjoy this stuff and you don't need to be 
a serious researcher. You don't have to be an academic. Anybody is welcome to come and look at our archives. Thank you very much for listening. That is me done. Thank you. And I'll hand back to Michael now to introduce our next speaker. OK, thank you. That was that was a fascinating presentation. And um, having visited the Bishop's Gate Institute a number of times before, it is, you know, a, a fascinating library. Um, Monica, are we um, OK to proceed? Yes, I th yes thankfully. <laughs> apologies for that rocky right. start. Um, let me just... And uh, from beginning. Uh, good morning again, everybody. I'm Monica Cash, I'm the Deputy Librarian in the Linen Hall Library. And I am just going to start off with um, just giving you a bit of background about the Linen Hall Library. Um, established in 1788 to improve the mind and incite, excite a spirit of general inquiry, the Linen Hall Library is the oldest in Belfast and it is renowned for its unparalleled Irish and local studies collections. The library's history is intrinsically linked to the story of Belfast and it has played a pivotal role in the cultural and intellectual life of the city since its foundation. Um, I briefly, I will mention some of the key collections in our Irish and local studies collections. Uh, first of all, the Linen Hall Library's own archive, and it's one of the few um, institutions that has an extant archive of activities since, um, since it was established in 1780 until pre present day. It documents its rich history and gives provenance to the unique collections that we hold. The archive is also a testimony of endurance and survival, and it documents the library and Northern Ireland's journey through turbulence times, such as the 1798 rebellion, two world wars, and the recent troubles. Detailed membership records provide a rich source of genealogical information, whilst book catalogues, correspondence, events, programs, and photographs give a snapshot of reading trends, cultural ideals, and societal changes over the centuries. Um, we have the Belfast and Provincial Collection, which is one of the library's museum accredited collections, and it's a comprehensive collection of early Ulster printing, and it includes titles published from 1697 until 1979. The main part consists of Belfast printed books, with a smaller section consisting of provincial printers from towns such as Downpatrick, Derry, Strabane and Armagh. Um, we also have quite a large genealogy section, um, which attracts researchers both locally and internationally. But now two of the most notable resources in this collection are the Belfast newsletter, newspapers, births, deaths and marriages index. And that was painstakingly put together by members of staff and covers the years 1738 until 1863. And another unique resource is the Blackwood pedigrees, which consists of 94 handwritten notebooks bequeathed to the library by its past president and avid genealogist Reginald Blackwood, and this contains the lineage of a thousand Ulster families. The newspaper collection dates back to 1738 and completes the, and, con, and includes the most complete holdings of the Belfast newsletter. Now, it is thought that the Belfast newsletter is the oldest English language newspaper that's still printed today. Um, and we also have a complete run of a rare newspaper the Northern Star, which was published by the Society of the United Irish Men in the 1790s. The postcard collection contains over 7,000 postcard images, and this captures Ireland in bygone days and gives a sense of what life was like in the towns and villages across the country in the last century. And this collection has been digitized and is available online. The Theatre and Performing Arts Archive is a tre treasure trove of theatrical material the earliest items in the collection include a collection of 18th century play scripts and 19th century playbills, with 20th century editions from Ulster actors, playwrights, managers and companies. And the archive comprises of several thousand original programmes, handbills, posters, photographs, letters, news cuttings, um, many from theatres that are still in existence, like the Grand Opera House, but probably one of the biggest strengths of this collection is we have the archives of a lot of theatres which are no longer in existence. And finally, a quick mention about the Northern Ireland Political Collection, which is the definitive archive of the Troubles and the subsequent peace process. Since 1969, 
it is collected without fear or favour and has amassed 350,000 items, including literature, posters, ephemera, press cuttings and important archives such as the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Archive and the Northern Ireland Women's Rights Archive. This too has museum accreditation. So in common with other local studies collection, the library holds numerous local history books, pamphlets and periodicals. But of course, to produce these publications, the authors often rely heavily on the resources of libraries and archives. So I thought I'd briefly discuss some of the resources that researchers might consult if they come into the library and the research in the Belfast Blitz. Now, Belfast was attacked by the Luftwaffe on four occasions during April and May 1941. Estimates vary, but it's believed that between 1900 and 1,100 civilians, military servants and emergency personnel lost their lives, with a further 1,500 injured. 50,000 houses were damaged, leaving 100,000 temporarily homeless. The most destructive raid took place on the 15th of April, Easter Tuesday, resulting in the greatest loss of life in a night raid during the Blitz outside of London. It was believed that the Luftwaffe's intention was to target the docks, shipyards and industrial areas, but it was primarily residential areas in the north and east of the city that were hit. And the library is privileged to hold a key primary resource in the form of two full ledgers of ARP warden notes taken on Easter Tuesday, which track every stage of destruction in a badly hit part of North Belfast. So here you'll see a couple of examples. Um, the first example was taken at 4.35 in the morning <coughs> and just says a car overturned and a crater in the road. Well, there's the, the photograph to prove it. And the poet John Hewitt later described how this single bomb in Hewitton Avenue had torn the concrete road in a wedge gash and in the gaping maw, a topple car was wedged. The second example is Sunningdale Park. And this was a direct hit on a residential street where many of the houses were completely demolished. Um, the occupants of number seven, for instance, Henry and Florence Simon and their 19 year old son, Jeffrey, were killed instantaneously. However, five days later, um, when neighbors were clearing the rubble, rubble, they actually found the family's pet dog under rubble in the garage, completely unharmed. And this is um, a, a, very, a very tragic event that took place that night. And it was uh, post 381 that it first reported at the control center that high explosives had fallen on Lincoln Avenue. Now, <coughs> Lincoln Avenue was a working class area of terrace houses. And in total, it's believed 14 people lost their lives in the one hit. And as you can see, a later report shows that um, four people in 11 Lincoln Avenue lost their lives. We have an account from Teresa Duffy, who was um, a member of that family. And she recalls her mother herself and her two siblings being pulled from the wreckage. However, her father, <coughs> excuse me, James Duffy, who was 52 and an ex-policeman, her sister Kathleen, who was 21, a shop assistant, and her siblings, James and Josephine, were all found dead. And um, stories such as the Duffy's story was replicated across Belfast these, that night. And these notebooks are a key primary resource for those researching the havoc that was wreaked upon the north of the city that night. And again, you can see it in the street directories, in the Belfast street directories. The residents of Lincoln Avenue are all listed. But sadly, in 1941, we can see that numbers 1 to 17 are basically just vacant. So, um, and again, this is something that we recently rediscovered, I should say, in the archives. And it was a photo album of 72 photos of bomb sites in Belfast. So again, um, this is another, another um, source for researchers to come in and look, because a lot of these pictures aren't out in the public domain. <coughs> so again, just some very briefly about um, the Belfast um, spirit during, during the war. From the outset, the Belf people of Belfast and Northern Ireland fully embraced the war effort. And in August 1940, the Belfast Telegraph launched an appeal to its readers to donate money so that one Spitfire could be bought for the Royal Air Force. 
It captured the public's imagination and in the end enough money was raised to buy 17 Spitfires which were flown in World War II, including in the Battle of Britain. In total, almost £89,000 was raised, I think, which is nearly three million in today's money. And in recognition of this contribution from Northern Ireland, each Spitfire was given an Ulster name, such as Antrim, Bangor, Portadown. <coughs> and you can see here, regardless of how little, how much they gave, the number of every single donor and the amount raised was published in the paper. And the library is lucky enough to have a bound volume of every single subscription list, which runs to thousands of names and businesses across the province. So I thought I would finish off with the reflections of Frank Burgoyne, who was a Linen Hall's librarian during the war, war years. And thankfully the library was pretty unscathed by the ravage, ravages of war. And in fact, membership boomed. However, in the 1945 annual report, Frank Burgoyne reports, the past year has been a difficult one with regard to the supply of books and binding. Paper restriction and labour shortage still persist. And consequently, it has been impossible to obtain sufficient copies of certain books to meet the demand. Rebinding has been restricted by reason of storage of material and labour, and only a comparatively few volumes have been rebound. There are now several thousand volumes stored away for binding when opportunity occurs. This shortage of books has been the cumulative, cumulative during the past few years, and the efficiency of the library has suffered accordingly for fewer books are now available than would, would have been under normal circumstances, and the resulting increase in wear has left its mark upon our stock of books generally. However, he is delighted that his um, deputy or his sub-librarian has returned from war and says that after five years absence on war duties, our sub-librarian, Mr. J. H. M. Woods, has returned and taken up his duties as head of this department. His experience and wide knowledge will greatly add to its importance. So if anybody's interested in finding out any more about the library, um, there are a lot of collections online at the moment. So we have the Extraordinary Women collection, um, postcards, part of our political collection can be found in Divided Society, our literary archives, a selection of those are available on the literary archive. And again, um, about 10 years ago, we digitized a major part of our theater archive which can be accessed too. So if you go onto the Linen Hall website, you'll be able to get um, access to all of these. And as Michelle said, everybody is welcome to come into the library. We are delighted to have visitors back. Seeing people again in person is wonderful. Um, so, but if in the meantime, um, you would like any further information or you plan to visit and would like to contact me in advance, I'd be delighted to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. That was um, so informative and um, so, quite poignant at times as well. Um, right, now we'll be moving on to our third speaker today, Argula Rudlack, um, who is the History Librarian at uh, Senate House Library. Hello everybody. Um, yeah, this is going to be a difficult one to follow up, but I'll certainly give you a flavour of what we have at Senate House Library. And I'm going to mainly focus on researching London history for this part of the session, but we also have a, um, a collection that relates to local history across the UK more generally. But first of all, what I'll do is I'll give you a brief overview over our London history collections that we have at the library. And then what I'll also do is give you a case study of an example of how you can use our collections for your own research. And I've just opened the presentation here with our really nice little wooden case of the complete run of the Illustrated London News. So you can get a flavor of what the library looks like from the inside. Um, but for those of you who are not familiar with Senate House Library yet, we are the central library for the University of London, and we're also one of the UK's largest collections in the arts, humanities and social sciences. We hold print and electronic research collections, over 50 unique printed special collections, and over 1,800 archive and manuscript collections. And we're located on the fourth floor of the South Block of Senate House in Bloomsbury, and that's right next door to the Institute of Historical Research. Before we dive into the case study, um, here's a brief overview of our London history collections. 
really London history can be found across all our library collections and there's tons for you to explore. A good place to start is the printed special collections, which are our rare and unique materials that we hold. Um, this includes the Bromhead Library, which contains about 4,000 different items from the 17th century to the early 20th century on the history of London. But many of our other printed special collections also contain material that relate to London and its history, so you shouldn't just restrict your search to one collection. As part of our archives, we hold the University of London's own archive, which has a vast amount of material for those who wish to learn about the institution itself and higher education in London more broadly, among, again, many other archives that we have related to the history of London. Then there are our research collections. These include materials such as academic monographs and journals, but also more unusual things such as pamphlets or the output of small press publishers. So historically, valuable materials aren't necessarily only confined to our special collections and archive. Um, and it's always worth to take a look at the shelves or what you might be able to request from our stacks in the tower. Then finally, we have a huge amount of online resources available, including specific e-resources that bring together digitized London history sources, such as the e-resource London Low Life, just to name one of the many examples. So let's now turn to the case study I'd like to talk to you about today. This is uh, some research that I did very recently um, to get some inspiration for this session. My first step was to take a look at the most recent issue of the London Journal to review some recent scholarship in the academic community on London's history. This article in particular caught my eye. It's called As Well As By The English As By The Strangers, Performing a Multicultural London in the Magnificent Entertainment by Catherine Blankenau. The article analyzes a text by Thomas Decker called The Magnificent Entertainment, which describes the pageant or show put on for James VI or James I's royal entry into London in 1604. The text describes in some describes in some detail how London's Dutch and Italian communities contributed to the procession. And Blankenau argues that this was a mechanism for these communities to assert their presence in London's wider community during the public ceremony. The text therefore points us to a quite interesting tension of the performance of different identities between an idea of Englishness and a more inclusive idea of multiculturalism. So I was curious to find out if Senate House Library had other pageant texts such as these and if similar dynamics between the conceptions of Englishness and foreignness were played out in them. So my first step was to look up Decker's Magnificent Entertainment on our catalogue and I was able to confirm that we have a copy. To go a bit further with my research, I scrolled down to the bottom of the record of our copy. This is where you can find so-called subject headings. These are hyperlinked subject terms that are applied by librarians to describe library items, and they can be a really good way to help you discover different clusters of items which relate to the same topic. So by clicking on the heading pageants, England, London, 17th century, I was able to discover 27 additional items from which I could select a few to continue my research. After examining some of the catalog entries, I was able to identify some further pageant accounts in which we can see these dynamics between Englishness and foreignness I just um, summarized played out. So one of them is John Tatum's account of the pageant held by, for the mayor of London in 1661. During the afternoon of the procession, um, a scene is described leading into a speech titled the European speech. The person who gives the speech is described as someone who, quote, is figured and habited in the fashion or manner of several nations which trade and relate to Europe, end quote. The speech itself also emphasizes that the figure is supposed to represent a composite of different people and countries, including Spain, Holland, France, Italy, Portugal, Sweden, and Poland. Jointly, these countries are described as those, and I quote again, with whom you, i.e. the Lord Mayor, traffic in all parts of Christendom, end quote. 
The latter parts of the speech also place a great emphasis on European trade and how London as a city benefits from it. But unlike in Decker's 1604 pageant texts, um, though the European communities of London are not afforded their own presence or their own voice, rather they're represented chiefly as external trading partners, albeit important ones for the city's flourishing. Um, so the inclusion of what, uh, what might be called foreigners in a notion of London identity shifts with different texts. There are also others who might have been described as strangers or foreigners at the same time um, who can be found in pageant texts such as these. Uh, one example of this is the 1692 account of the, Lo the Lord Mayor show, um, and this one is titled The Triumphs of London. On page three of this text, there is a description um, of the first part of the procession, which is staged by the Worshipful Company of Grocers. In it, um, there is a so in it a presence of what may be a black person is described, and they are said to be dressed. And again, I quote: "According to the Indian manner." End quote. So what appear to be members of the black community frequently make appearances throughout these different pageant texts and uh, one person who's analyzed these presences is Tracy Hill with her book pageantry and power a cultural history of the early modern Lord Mayor show. In it she argues that we cannot be certain that um, these people were um, performers who might have been white actors in blackface or if they're actually embodied by black actors themselves, but that there is an intriguing possibility that pageant text might depict individuals representing men members of London's new or settled black communities. So that's just a very simple example of how you might be able to conduct research into our London collections and the different communities that are represented within it. Um, but there is tons more possibilities to dig into our London collections. So how can you use the library yourself to find what you might be interested in? All the materials that I just mentioned have come from the Bromhead Library. And to search the Bromhead Library itself, you can visit its collection description page on our website. On here, you find a summary of the contents of the collection and some information on how it can be searched on our catalog. But again, I'd also encourage you to explore other printed special collections and archives beyond this one. There's a lot of additional material that can be discovered beyond this one collection. You can also use our catalog, uh, which is accessible through the library's homepage. For specific searches, I would recommend that you use our advanced search function. This will allow you to combine different keywords, author searches, title searches, or subject searches. So you could, for example, type in London as a subject search, combined with a keyword of your choice. And the advanced search also includes a um, date filter to allow you to limit your results by dates. Um, I also encourage you to look at our A to Z list of all our databases that we subscribe to. We have almost 500 different databases indexed as part of this list, which you can explore either by subject, by database type, or with the search box on the right hand side of the page. And although many of the databases are only accessible with a Senate House Library membership, there are also several free databases for you to explore on here. So even if you're not currently a member, I definitely go and see uh, what we might have for your topic of choice. Um, if you need any further help with your with your, your searches or your research, you can visit the research support page that includes a lot of helpful guides and videos to help you use the library and its collections. We also hold a selection of thematic research support sessions during every academic year, um, similar to this one where we try to help you explore research topics in a bit more depth. We also have one-to-one -one research support appointments uh, available with subject specialist librarians in our library team with whom you can discuss your research topic individually. And if you're looking for some further inspiration on how to use our collections, we also have an active blog on which we post regularly. And here are just some examples of some past blog posts we've written about London local and community history. 
So if you're interested in using the library or becoming a member, you can register with the library in advance of your visit. Um, we have a lot of different membership options, a lot of which are free for students and academics, um, but we also have some paid membership options for people currently not affiliated with the university. Um, the library also offers five pound day tickets and there is completely free access um, to our printed special collections, archives and manuscripts. So um, you are very much encouraged to visit our library if you are in any way interested in any of the collect our collections. We'd really love to welcome you to our library. And yeah, so lastly, if you have any questions or if we can help you in any way with your research, please do contact us. Uh, you can either contact the main library email address or you can also contact me directly. And we'd really love to hear from you. And thank you very much for listening. And now I'll hand over back to Mike to um, do his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Right, let me just share. Right, okay, um, so uh, good morning, as said, um, I'm Michael Townsend, uh, one of the collection librarians here at the Institute for Historical Research, and I'll talk briefly today about the IHR uh, uh, in general, as well as its local history collections. However, I will also be focusing more specifically in line with today's themes of towns and cities um, on some of the resources you can find on the history of social housing in the UK from the 19th to the 21st century. Why is that not? Sorry. There we go. <laughs> uh, just a bit of context first. Um, the Institute is just over a century old now, and during that time, the library has amassed over 200,000 volumes. Um, the main remit of the library is to collect published primary sources, which make the vast bulk of what can be found in our collections. Although we'd also co actively collect published bibliographies, source guides, archive and manuscript catalogues, some reference works, and a large range of historical periodicals as well. And chronologically, uh, we cover everything from the early medieval period and geographically we concentrate on Western Europe and the colonial histories of the West European empires, North and South America, as well as the subject of today, regional and local history. Uh, the library's collections on uh, British local history are among uh, their largest of almost 13,000 separate titles. Uh, these are split over several collections, including Irish, Welsh, Scottish and English local history, with the latter currently the largest. We also have a collection specifically on the history of London, too. Uh, the strengths of these collections include large holdings of local history societies. Uh, for example, we have large collections on the histories of Norfolk, Yorkshire and Kent, uh, largely thanks to our collections of various record society publications for these counties some stretching back to the 19th century. You can also find significant collections of directories, again, some stre stretching back to the 18th century and roughly to the early 20th century, as well as a significant collection of poll books, mainly covering Eng English counties and cities and towns um, during the 18th and 19th centuries. Moreover, uh, being in a privileged position of having the Victoria County History's central office based within the IHR since 1932 uh, means the library has amassed, an, ma amassed a, an extensive collection of the VCH's publications, including the Red Books, um, undoubtedly a central resource for anyone researching English local history. And in addition, um, if anyone is interested in the local history, histories of other nations or is conducting comparative research, the library has large collections for the local history of France, Germany, Spain, Italy, the Low Countries and the United States as well. As said, the collections are extensive, so as a case study, I delved into them to see what could be found on the history of um, social and council housing in the UK from the 19th to the 20th, 21st century. This in, in itself is a huge subject 
especially for a short presentation like this. So um, what follows will highlight mainly some of the biographical sources one could use while researching this field, both in the collections um, one can find in the IHR library and some resources that can be found online as well. Before moving on to the biographical um, sources, though, it's worth mentioning that the library does have uh, useful collections of official sources relevant to this subject too. Uh, there are several works specifically on housing, such as listed here, including Patrick Abercrombie's uh, Greater London Library, Greater London Plan of 1944, and the report into the Ronan Point disaster of 1968. Also present in the library are several works which um, give the theoretical underpinnings of 20th century town planning, such as the selected works of the engineer and architect Raymond Nunwin. For the various waves of legislation which um, formed the foundation of much of the history of British social housing in this period, resources such as Hansard, the Commons and Lords Journal, as well as the UK parliamentary papers are online are um, accessible within this library too. Uh, therefore, uh, here we have two types of sources, I, you know, I'd like to say. The first are specific, which uh, where one can find relevant source material quite easily, since it's the main subject of the work, um, while the second tend to have more to, tend to have a more general focus, where one has to delve and dig within the volumes and pages for the information one might be looking for. This is a distinction. Um, we can see in some of the biographical sources that we will discuss. Uh, within Margaret Thatcher's autobiography, for example, of her years uh, within Downing Street, one can find, uh, among a myriad of other subjects, substantial material on her thoughts about social housing and its residents, as well as the right to buy policy first introduced in 1980. As you might imagine, similar relevant, relevant information can also be found within other political volumes available within the library, especially during the busy periods when housing le legislation was enacted, such as the early 1920s and during the Attlee government. Biographical sources, however, do not exclusively present the voice of the policy policymakers. There are a number of titles within the, the library where experience of council estate residents or former residents can also be um, heard. Sticking with political biographies uh, for a while longer, the three memoirs published by the former MP Alan Johnson um, set, within, um, an, set, set within an overarching narrative of his political development and eventual rise within the Labour Party also include, among other things, his reflections on living in a council flat in Battersea with his sister in the mid-1960s and later on on a council estate in Slough in the early 1970s. Similar reflections can be found in the memoirs of the Irish historian Professor Marianne Elliott, who weaves her own personal memories of growing up on the mixed Catholic and Protestant white city housing estate in Belfast into the broader history of the estate and the city during the 1950s and 60s, as well as the estate's subsequent history from the 1970s. Similar to biographies, uh, relevant information can also be found in published letters and diaries. The library has an extensive collection of these types of works, and again, while there are some concentrate specifically on social housing, like the edition of the letters and essays of Victorian social reformer Octavia Hill, um, uh, one, uh, with others, one will need to delve into their pages more extensively. For example, here in the diary of Christopher Addison, who as Minister for Reconstruction from 1917 to 19, formed the foundation of David Lloyd George's attempted housing reform to the early 1920s. So far, the sources highlight, highlighted have um, been those of either policymakers or former residents. Um, what about the testimony, testimony of council, council state or housing association residents who witnessed, in some cases, the creation of housing estates or the tragic consequences of social and physical neglect and maladministration? This is something that is harder at the moment to find in the IHR library. Uh, but there are a number of oral histories, um, published oral histories, uh, which either include interviews with residents um, among other sources, such as Andre Aleknovich's research on the Beacon Tree Heath estate in Dagenham, or Michael Roman's oral history of the Aylesbury estate in Southeast London. 
while others present larger extracts or even whole interviews, such as the works shown here on the Toxtest riots in 1981 or the Grenfell um, Tower fire. Given that oral history testimony um, often comes in an audiovisual format, however, it is natural that many um, have become available online. Listed here are some of the projects either spearheaded by local universities or by community-led history societies. As you can imagine, uh, these, these are invalu an invaluable resource, giving voice to residents. Although like um, any online resources, they do need to meet, be maintained to remain functional. There are two more um, online resources I'd like to um, draw your attention to. The first is uh, Layers of London, uh, which is a freely accessible to everyone. Uh, the core of the project um, is a growing number of maps which have been digitized and which can be overlaid on each other. However, equally important are the, addi the additions made by contributors, which include scanned photographs, illustration, or as seen here, personal stories. Uh, this one about the Simpsons family uh, Christmas celebrations in their new council house um, on the Beacon Tree Heath estate in 1954. Uh, the other online uh, resources I want to mention is Mass Observation Online. Uh, within this compendious resource on the UK's 20th century um, history, you can find diaries, questionnaires, and surveys on a myriad of subjects, including housing. Uh, mass, mass Observation is available online within the IHR library, although at present we are unable to provide offsite access, unfortunately. Um, although if you're currently enrolled at a university, you might be able to see if they can provide off-site off access for you. So to finish up, um, I just wanted to mention a few methods I've used to find relevant resources for this subject. Um, until a couple of months ago, I wasn't really that well acquainted with um, social housing history. So my first port of call, um, naturally, uh, was the catalogues. Um, I started with the library's own catalogue, uh, but also employed several others, such as Library Hub Discover, which allows you to search um, dozens of UK and Irish library catalogues at once, and the archive catalogue of the National Archives, which uh, not only includes the holdings of the NA, but two and a half thousand other archives too. Next, um, I found it worth checking both general bibliographies and specific ones that have been published on this subject, uh, such as the BBIH, which will be discussed in a later session. Um, I also checked if there were any relevant subject guides published, which can be found, which give a sound overview of the relevant types of um, sources that might be, uh, might be useful. Um, after that, uh, I checked a reference works, which I find particularly useful, the Directory of Rare Book and Special Collections, uh, just to see which libraries uh, may have significant collections on the history of housing. Um, obviously, I did stumble across Bishopsgate as well, but um, in this case, I also was, um, discovered that the George Henry Wood collection uh, was quite useful in the history of housing, um, in, currently um, available in the University of Huddersfield. And lastly, uh, there's what I call the Snowwall method. Um, references both within the notes and bibliographies of several monographs and art articles I consulted initially pointed me in the direction of other useful titles and those in turn pointed me into other useful titles and you, you get the pattern. Um, this can be a little bit more haphazard um, than some of the other method, methods I've already mentioned, but it does generally generate a list of potentially useful um, resources quite quickly and can point you in the direction of the relevant parts of broad bodies of sources like government papers. Uh, I've used these methods and resources in the past researching unrelated subjects, so hopefully some of these um, methods and resources might be useful for you as well. So just before we move on to the Q&A this morning, uh, part of this session here, um, uh, some of the details here, you can, uh, how you can contact the IHR library, and if you would like to join, uh, the simple way that we can set up your membership, which is free for everyone. And um, don't worry about writing the links down in this session. Um, they will be included in a list of resources uh, sent to all attendees at the end of this session. Thank you. Right, so I'll just stop sharing now. Right, so I hope 
people have found that this, um, the talk's useful today. Um, uh, I'm just wondering, you know, just, just a, as a general um, question, whether uh, there's any resources or methods that um, any of you have found particularly useful when re re um, researching local history at all, you know, talking to the other speakers today. Because um, usually I, 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 you know, that directory um, of rare books and special collections, that's almost like my Bible when I'm um, starting to research a subject. Um, so <laughs> and I should imagine it's available in lots of other libraries as well. Just a question about layers of London. Um, I'll I'll talk to the person who um, administers it in the IHR today, um, and just to see if um, uh, any of the glitches might be um, might be resolved anytime soon. So, just to um, come in on your previous question, while we're still waiting for people to pose their own questions, um, two things came to mind that I found quite useful to find not necessarily only London local libraries and local mm. history collections, but also more broadly UK ones. There is the Association of Independent Libraries, many of which are scattered throughout the UK. Um, they might also be in that directory um, that mm. Mike mentioned, but they also have their own website. So that might be worth checking out to find more localized, uh, very unique library collections that you can use for your local history research. And then um, we have a session later coming up on this, but there's a British Association for Local History as well, which I find another really useful resource to delve into um, uh, local history resources. Um, so that's just two recommendations that come to my mind uh, for people who might want more resources um, to find local history, but uh, maybe Monica and Michelle have further ideas as well. Yeah, I just, I find all of the um, local studies archives in London incredibly Useful. I mean, they're, they're very, it's very random which ones are open at which times and they all have really different opening hours and so you need to check them out. But but to me, that's always my first port of call is to go to the individual boroughs local studies archive and start to explore that way. And I, can, I don't want to jump the gun and just seeing a point that's coming from Chris Marshall there about access to libraries varying greatly and that is I mean, that's a, a really good point. It's, it's not particularly inclusive and it is a real struggle, you know, speaking as somebody who was involved in academia and then has ended up working outside academia to have access to all of the rich resources that are available is, is a real struggle. And, but everyone, I, I would say within the sector is trying their best to make things more accessible. I don't know if anyone else wants to come in there because obviously I can't speak to this because the Institute is open to all, but, but yeah. The Linen Hall is actually a subscription library. We do have membership charges, but we are open to all. We have an open door policy. Um, there are benefits from being a member. Obviously, you can borrow material and there are discounted rates on uh, photocopying and, and events. But we are delighted to have everybody come through the door. The only thing I would say is if you want to see some of the special collections, it is best getting in touch with myself for the librarian beforehand because we do need to set up an appointment for that. Mm. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're open to everyone so you, you can be, you don't have to be affiliated with the university or anything, but um, some of our resources are on uh, closed access, so we'll need to be ordered prior to your visit. So um, echoing what Monica said, um, just get in contact with us and um, we can um, get things ready for you before you come along. So. We've had a question also about um, um, when you talk about local history, how far back in time do you go? Um, just from the IHR's perspective, we, we're basically um, early medieval, about, um, about fifth century onwards, basically. We do have a few archaeological reports that stretch back to um, the Roman period, uh, especially for our London collection, but there's also uh, a uh, another library within, within the School of Advanced Study called the Institute for Classical Studies. And they tend to uh, cover the period uh, prior to the fifth century. I don't know about you, Arthur, how far you go. Yeah, I mean, just to come in on that, it kind of depends. So I think you'll find a lot of material that relates to medieval, early modern um, 
maybe even ancient local history in our research collection. So we have a lot of publications that are published about those periods when it comes to primary source material, like the ones I mentioned in my presentation, that kind of depends. Um, so we have, so for the London collections, I think the Bromhead Library is a pretty good source for that. We also have a lot of online primary source collections that cover that, but it could it could be a little bit more patchy. So it depends on what you're looking for. And we also have a little bit of a few books on archaeology, um, but again, maybe other places might have more extensive collections. The place I could think of that might be a good um, call, call to look at might be the Museum of London. I think they have their own library collection as well. Um, so just to just an idea, you'd probably have to get in touch with them to see how easily accessible those collections are. But yeah, um, we're definitely not the only place that has a lot of cool things. I would encourage people to hop between different institutions and hop between different libraries. And we, we are very happy to take any queries as librarians. We tend to be quite approachable and we're very happy to help you with stuff. So don't feel like you need to restrict yourself to one collection. Um, we've had a question about loan schemes. Um, uh, say, obviously, Understandably, um, if you don't live in London, research can be quite expensive. Um, are there any loan schemes between libraries or local studies in place? Um, I think the closest thing would be the Sconnell scheme, I think, but I think you have to be currently studying a university. I'm, I'm not aware, unfortunately, of any um, schemes at the moment, but I can check up on that. Um, I don't know whether anyone else might be aware of anything similar like that. Three of our um, collections are accredited, oh. uh, the Burns Collection, um, <clears throat> the Belfast Printed Book and the Northern Ireland Political Collection. So we do have reciprocal loan schemes with other museums for um, items from those collections. Thank you. And um, we've also had another collection. Um, do all your libraries um, include... Email popped up. Do your libraries include local histories of dying perverse communities uh, across time throughout the UK? Um, that's something that we, we're quite keen to actively um, collect upon now um, in the IHR, definitely. And I, it sounds also it, the same in um, uh, for the other speakers today as well. Wouldn't you agree? I'd say definitely, yes, mm. absolutely. And I think a lot of the time it also depends on how you read your sources so I mean the books that I mentioned were originally collected completely for a completely different purpose and not to represent diverse communities in London so I think it's also about trying to re-examine the sources that are already there and making those maybe unexpected connections that you might not have uh, made before but yeah it's, it's it's more difficult to find those sources because it is unfortunately a field of study that has historically been neglected but there's a lot of really good uh, material being made available in this area now and increasingly so so um, but if you want to talk about that I'm, uh, I'm very happy to um, discuss this further outside the session too it's an area I'm really interested in too so do feel free to contact me about that if you have any follow-up questions okay well um, I think we're coming to the end of this um, first session now um, obviously if you've got any other follow-up questions uh, feel free to contact us our contact details will be sent out uh, to all attendees at the end of this session and um, hopefully um, we can see um, a number of you um, you'll be attending the second session at 2 p.m uh, which will be on online resources which will discuss um, resources such as British history online and the bibliography of British Irish history so hope you you found this um, session useful thank you <laughs>